This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is the son of one of the most popular and beloved stars in the history of television, Isabel Sanford, whose portrayal of Louise Jefferson or Wheezy, as we came to know her, first on All in the Family, and then for 11 seasons on The Jeffersons, made her a household name. After a distinguished career on the stage, she landed the role of Tilly in the classic 1967 movie, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, opposite Catherine Hepburn, Spencer Tracy, and Sidney Poitier. From there, she was cast as Louise Jefferson, next door neighbor to the Bunkers on the groundbreaking TV show, All in the Family. And that led to the incredibly successful spin-off, The Jeffersons. Isabel Sanford received seven Emmy Award nominations and won an Emmy in 1981, making her the first and still the only African-American woman to win an Emmy Award for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Comedy Series. She was also nominated for five Golden Globe Awards. She won two NAACP Image Awards. And in 1981, she won a Genie Award from the American Women in Radio and Television Association. In 1985, she received an honorary doctorate from Emerson College. She has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And in 2004, she and her co-star Sherman Hemsley won a TV Land Award for Favorite Cantankerous Couple. Our guest has written a wonderful, heartwarming book entitled Her Fans Call Her Wheezy, But I Call Her Mom, in which he shares many poignant and life-altering moments with his beloved mama and allows us to get to know the real person behind the beloved actress, a courageous single mother of three children who, despite many challenges in her life, showed remarkable determination and remained focused on becoming a successful actress. Our guest has had a successful music career as a percussionist, and he's worked with Quincy Jones, Marvin Gaye, Johnny Guitar Watson, Bobby Womack, Cuba Gooding Sr., and The Main Ingredient. I'm delighted to welcome Sanford K. Sanford to our show. Sanford, thank you so much for being here. Wow, that's a great introduction. <laughs> I didn't know he's going to do all that, but that's good. I'm glad to be on the great Harvey Brownstone show. <laughs> and it's a thrill to have you. I want to start by asking you how it came to be that your first name and your last name are the same. Isabel's maiden name was Sanford. And then when she uh, got married, her last name was Richmond. So she wanted to keep Sanford in the you know, in the family, that name. So she gave it to me for a first name. And then she, her stage name, she, she kept her maiden name for her stage name. And then I assumed her, her maiden name myself after I've gotten, I, you know, when I was about 17 or 18 years old. So I've been Sanford, Sanford, you know, for years. And that's the reason, you know, look, my mother was a mother and father for me. So I said, I might as well assume her name. Plus, it's a little sexy for me to be Sanford Sanford, <laughs> other than Sanford Richmond. So my whole name is Sanford Keith Richmond Sanford, and I just go by Sanford Sanford. Okay, so now we've cleared that up. Now, Sanford, mm-hmm. your mom passed away almost 20 years ago. What took you so long to write this book? Uh, you know, I, I'm on Facebook and everything, and, and I see them saluting, saluting her on her birthday and everything. And then somebody said, Somebody should need to write a sto- uh, a life story on her, and one of my friends uh, on, and I said, "Yeah, I might as well check that out and see if I can do it." I never, you know, I never wrote a book before, but I I figured I can do it. So, I got inspired by my son. My son is he's Doctor Sanford Richmond, got a PhD. He wrote a book a while back during the Obama uh, era, talking about hip hop is not dead; it's in the White House. So I said, uh, okay, let me do mine. Let me do one. So with the inspiration of my son, I started on it. And during the pandemic, I, I guess I sort of slowed up. And then I had, then I caught prostate cancer for a minute, slowed up a little bit on that. But I beat all that and kept it moving, you know. So I ended up making sure I get everything together 
and it finally uh, came to fruition a month ago. Came out a month ago, but I've been yeah. hard. I've been grinding hard for the last year at least, trying to get this out. Tell me, you know? why do you think your mom never wrote a memoir? I don't know, but Brad, Brad Lee Mac, he interviewed her a few times to set up because the information he used to interview her, I used some of that in the book because I'm glad he uh, interviewed her and she told a few stories about her history. So that helped me. So uh, Brad Lee Mac, he, he had figured out that maybe we, she should have, you know, some somebody to write something down for a uh, biography for her. So he was, I guess he was starting it, but I don't know if he ever finished it. So therefore, I just said, let me go on and take this. And I, and I started it and finished it. Now, Sanford, you were born in the Bronx, New York. And when you were 12 years old, your mom decided to move you and your two siblings to Los Angeles so she could pursue an acting career, even though she had very little money and no Hollywood connections. What did you think of the move to California at that time? You know what? <laughs> I didn't really think nothing of it. I just figured, you know, what I was thinking of California at 12 years old was a bunch of white people playing tennis <laughs> and golf. <laughs> That's all I thought about what California was till I got in Los Angeles. And when we rode through Los Angeles, I said, oh, it's a whole new ball game then. <laughs> I seen a little bit of everybody there. But, I, you know, she said we're going. And when she said we're going, there's nothing I can do about it. I, I wasn't mad. I, I just, it was a new adventure for me. That's, Don't you think it was incredibly courageous of her to make that move? Yeah, but yes, I do. But at that age, I didn't think that. I just figured we were just moving, that's all. But she did, you know, it was a, a big step, a giant step she took. Oh, now, for really sure. Now, your mom's mother, your grandmother was very strict and did not support your mom's show business aspirations, but she had a grade five school teacher, Miss Buskin, who really believed in her and changed her life. And over the years, your mom tried very hard to reconnect with Mrs. Buskin to let her know that she'd made it. Tell us about the letter your mom finally got from Miss Buskin's daughter. I was so moved by that. To tell you about the letter, I, you know, at, the, at that time, I didn't, um, when I gave her the letter, like I went to the other room to watch sports. And when I came back, she was sort of tearing and handed me the letter. And I read it and I said, finally, because all through the years she was hoping Miss Buskin, you know, followed her and knew where she was and whatever. And we, she never knew if she was watching or whatever. And she always wanted to let her know that she found, she chased the dream that Miss Buskin suggested for her. You know, I I sort of, you know, I sort of got emotional at that time also, because I said, you finally did it. You know, you, you finally found out what was going on. So we both just, you know, was happy. Because it turns out that Miss Buskin did follow your mom's career. She was aware of all the success your mom had, and it was just such a beautiful thing for you to put in the book. Now, Sanford, your mom's first job in Hollywood was to co-star with Tallulah Bankhead in a play called Here Today that went on tour. And some of the hotels did not allow Black people to stay there. Tell me about the racism that your mom had to deal with. You know, I think she was sort of used to it at that time. But the people who really got upset was the director and the, and the stage manager who booked the hotel, who threatened to leave, threatened the whole cast to leave. You know, I said, but the clerk already told them that, you know, all the hotels have the same policy. So they uh, decided to uh, get booked on the side, the black people, the rooms that the black people normally rent, they went over there too to support her. But she wasn't outraged because she knew it. She's she's a calm person. The, the the person that was outraged was more of the assistant, the assistant director and the stage manager. They're the ones who really got upset. 
Well, Jose. they were absolutely right to be upset. And I'm glad that you've included this in the book because I think it's an important and shameful part of our history that we must never, never forget. Now, when your mom was filming Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy found out that your mom was taking the bus to the studio every day, they arranged for the studio to pay for a taxi, correct? Yes. <laughs> That's her first big, that's her first movie. The most money she ever made at that time. She was just trying to spend it on no, on no cab, <laughs> as she said, you know. And so, you uh, actually got to meet Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. Tell me about that. I did, I did. You know, at, at, at that time, I just, I met them. They were nice, they were friendly. And what, what really got to me is when I went, there the second, uh, you know, I came on the set about four times. They remembered my name, you know, and that's that's really was something because you know, you know, I forget names fast, but if they remembered my name, uh, it really meant something to me. And they was friendly, and you know, and I loved that when they had the lunchtime down there because whoever, whatever the catering, the people who did the catering, this did a good spread made me happy. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> now let's talk about the Jeffersons. When your mom was told that they were going to launch a spinoff of All in the Family called the Jeffersons, your mom was not in favor of it. Why not? Because she was secure in staying with All in the Family. You know, they, they were steady. She was there for like four, four years maybe at that time. And she felt, you know, she didn't do anything bigger at that time. And she didn't know if her show, the Jeffersons, would last, but she figured all in the family would. So she figured she stayed with all in the family. She wanted to stay with all in the family. But, you know, you know, they said the casting director said that if uh, they start the Jeffersons, they'll write her out and put in somebody else <laughs> as Miss Jefferson. <laughs> so that changed her mind. <laughs> well, thank but God for that. And one of the reasons for the success of the show was the amazing on-screen chemistry between your mom and Sherman Hemsley, who was actually living a very private and secret life as a closeted gay man. Tell me about their friendship. They were like best friends. I can, and you know, I talk to Sherman a lot when I when I when I'm on the set. Sherman was so friendly. As far as being gay, I I couldn't tell if he was or, or not, but it wasn't my business. But he was so friendly. They got along real good. And it was a happy family. You know, the show was it was just a, a big, happy family. As far as Sherman and uh, and Isabel go, they was like, you know, they, they was like husbands and wives. They I think they fussed a little bit, you know, on the set. But, you know, everything smoothed out and they and they kept it moving. So it was nice. You know, it, it was a good 11 years. Sherman gave a very emotional speech at your mother's funeral, correct? Yes. Can you tell me about that? Well, when he came up there, actually, he was uh, telling stories. And he was telling funny stories, too, you know, you know, trying to get some of the drama out of the, the atmosphere. And people was laughing and as he was talking. And then, I guess, all of a sudden, he realized he's at a, he's at Isabel's funeral, you know. So, and he realized she's not here no more. And at that time, he couldn't take it, so he just walked off the stage, right in the middle of a story. And the waves parted, and let him out, you know. But like I said, that there couldn't have been a, a better ending for at a funeral than that, you know. Till death do they part because they put them together for all those years as husband and wife. And I think that was a, a nice tribute to Isabel when Sherman came. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Do you know how Louise Jefferson got the nickname Wheezy? Yes. Sherman had a girlfriend back in Philadelphia named Louise, and he called her Wheezy. So he asked John Rich, one of the directors, can he call her that? Can you call her Wheezy? And John Rich said, it's okay with me, ask Isabel. 
So he asked Isabel, he asked moms, and uh, she said, okay, whatever. <laughs> and that's it. That's what she was wheezy ever since. And that name stuck. <laughs> it sure did. Is it true that your mom was instrumental in getting Marla Gibbs hired as the maid on the Jeffersons? I can't say she was in, I can say I can say she she helped because she was telling me, oh, that's that should be the maid. That should be the maid. I said, and I asked her, so did you say that to anyone else? She said, Yeah, she told the director, and then she told several people. That's that's the one. She's the one. And uh, so not that she was a hundred percent instrumental in it, but I think a percentage of her okay in it was you know was enough to help push her into the uh, into that spot, into that you know into that role. At the end of every season of the Jeffersons. Sanford, you always made a presentation to your mom and you gave her a bouquet of flowers. What did you say to her during those presentations? I can't remember everything I said, but I always gave her a tribute, thanked her for being my mother, for being a mother to millions of people. And, you know, and, and good luck next year <laughs> and stuff like that. At one point during the run of the Jeffersons, there was a survey in Hong Kong asking people which American they would trust the most. Your mother came out at number three on that list. How did she react to that? Yeah, she showed it to me. And, uh, you know, and, you know, I mean, it, you know, she loved it. She loved it. I liked it, too, you know. And uh, but that showed that uh, the Jeffersons stretch, you know, is worldwide. I didn't know it was what you know it was worldwide. She, I just thought it was in America, but I guess they showed it over there. So that that was shocking to know people in a foreign country liked her. She liked it, and I liked it. Well, how could you not love Isabel Sanford? How could you not? Now I read that your mom found out in a very inappropriate way that the Jeffersons was canceled. Is that true? Yes, they canceled it before. Uh, she heard it through a friend, I think, a friend of hers, that it was canceled. They didn't give no notice. They didn't be. They didn't have a final show, like some shows have a final show, but they didn't give the Jeffersons uh, the opportunity to have that. Did it bother her that they never did this closing episode like they did on Mary Tyler Moore or Mash? Yes, it did. Yes, it did bother her. The closest thing to satisfaction was. Marla Gibbs had a theater in Lamert Park, and then they did um, they did an episode of the Jeffersons, the, the whole cast. And so that, in a way, in a roundabout way, that was the final episode at the stage play. So uh, that was the closest that she came to a final closure. But, you know, she still was upset. You know, she went to the grave upset about that. Oh, but, um, that breaks my heart. You know, I wanted to tell you that one of my very dearest friends is Ernest Hardin Jr., who played Marcus on The Jeffersons. Are you close friends with him? I mean, Ernest has been uh, keeping in touch for the last 20 years. He, uh, and, you know, we run into each other every once in a while. And I went to his birthday party a month, about a couple of months ago. You know, me and Ernest is real good. And if it wasn't for Ernest, I don't think me and you be talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, we owe so much to Ernest. Ernest, if you're watching, we love you very much. Thank you for keeping the flame of the Jeffersons alive. Ernest does a lot of personal appearances at autograph shows and conventions. He and Marla Gibbs. And uh, I want to give a big shout out to my dear brother, Ernest. Now, you know, Sanford, there are so many moments in your book where I can see that your mom had a very powerful impact on you. For example, when you were a young child, your mom said to you, an undisciplined child makes an undisciplined man. Tell me how that statement impacted you. Well, it, <laughs> now the time that she did it, I think, I don't know if I put this in the book, but I was in the kitchen and, and I don't know what got into me, but I said something that was, wasn't right. And she uh, slapped me, 
<laughs> and after she did, I sort of, I, I stopped and wondered what, I, when they said they slapped the sense out of you, she did, because I didn't know what was going on. Then I realized she slapped me. So I started crying. I, I probably was about 11, 10, 11. And that's when she said it. <laughs> and it's, trust me, it stuck with me at that time. So have you been disciplined all your life? Uh, most of the time. <laughs> so we have Isabel to thank for that. Now, I know well, when you were 19, your mom gave you a serious talk about how you should approach your life. She said you should keep your eyes wide open, pick your battles carefully, allow the leadership inside you to come out, and develop a thick skin to get through all the disappointments in life. What did you think of that advice that she gave you? You know, I'm glad she gave me that advice because everything she said, I almost went through those scenes dealing with people that gave me all the, everything that she said to me, it, you know, came to fruition. And I'm glad she said it because then I, I knew what to do at that time. When, it, when they came up, when different things came up, my leadership came out. I knew what to do. Your mom told you that sometimes your dreams tell you what's going to happen. Have you found that to be true? Yeah, I do, cause because I am. I had a dream. I'm a dreamer anyway. So I had a dream in 2000, and in the dream it said, "Fool, play the saxophone." And now I'm a percussionist. I'm a master percussionist. It said, "Play the saxophone." I got up and st invented the sax and started playing and and then bought a sax and started playing. Never knew, never knew why I was doing it. People said, why are you playing the sax? I said, I don't know, but I'm practicing. And uh, and, I, and by, so by 2004, I finally got good enough to be professional to play on stage. And then Isabel passed. We went to a funeral and then I thought everything was over. Then Brad called me and said, we're going to have a memorial. And you can go on and uh, put a band together and play your horn. I said, that's it. That's why I was playing or practicing the horn. A higher power told me to practice. Because I still didn't know why I was doing it. And that was it. So I played at her memorial. If I had never played the horn, another note on that sax after that, I'd be okay with it. Because I found out why I was playing. I found... I found my calling on that saxophone, even though I still play it now. But I know why I was practicing. It finally, you know, I, I, it finally came to fruition again, and uh, I found out why. So tell and me that, something that that came to you through a dream. Has your mom ever visited you in your dreams since she passed away? About two or three times a month. Really? What does she tell you? Two, three times a month. We be doing things. You know, she, you know, we be doing something. We don't we don't talk about I don't in a way I don't bring up anything about, you know, her funeral or anything. But we just be doing something, going somewhere, doing something like every day. You know, like we would do if if she was here. And when I wake up, I realize that, you know, it was a dream, but we was together doing some things. So to me, she's visiting me when we do that. And, you know, like I say, I, uh, sometimes I can't wait to go to sleep, hoping she come in my dream. But I have been seeing her at least two or three times a month in my dreams. So I'm glad for that. Now, of course, there's another way to see her, and that's on the Jeffersons. Your mom passed away July 9th, 2004. She was 86. Since that date, Sanford, have you ever been able to bring yourself to watch the Jeffersons? No, I never, up to today, I never watched a full episode. I go over to some friend's house, and uh, they surprised me and turned it on an uh, episode. And, uh, you know, I can't take it, so, because I still be mourning, you know, it's still hard to take. So I come up with some excuse, and I leave. Either they have to turn it off or I leave. Most of the time I leave, they want to watch it, and I come up with some excuse. So I haven't seen a full episode of it still. 
you know, I see ex excerpts of it because I'm writing the book. And uh, but I never seen a whole show since at that time. Does it bring you comfort knowing that the world loves her so much and that she will live on forever because of that show? Yes, I found out, you know, you know, um, from my friends, from strangers, everyone loved it. And, and I'm telling them I'm writing a book and they were so happy. They, oh, you're going to sell a million copies on that, you know, and that and tells me how they and what they think of her. And I'm glad that they put her on, uh, on a high pedestal. It makes it easy for me, too, to sell books because they love her so much. It's not me selling books. It's her selling the books. You know, so it's just I'm just the messenger. Well, you know that we had Jay Moriarty on our show. He wrote a book about the Jeffersons, and he had so much praise for your mom, not just as a great actress, but as such a warm, loving human being who was such a team player. What do you think she would have thought of your book? Oh, uh, you know, it's a lot of, well, a lot of people said, I know your mother is happy. She's looking down on you she do, because I'm writing the book and they know she's just elated. And I think, you know, I think she'd be proud of me knowing that I'm, I did this. And I kept going. Matter of fact, when I got tired and, and thinking of other things that throw me off, all I do is think of her, what she would want me to do. And I jump right back and keep writing until I finish this. That's another thing she told me. If you start it, finish it. If you start something, finish it. And I did. So I'm happy. You must be thrilled that People Magazine has done such a beautiful story about your mom. Oh, yeah. Right. And I had a nice big book signing in California uh, a few days ago when I just got back. And everybody, you know, it's just, she just, everyone loves her. It's not me, even though some were my friends, it's they come for her. They come to give her a tribute and buy the book. And, you know, and the book has only been out less than a month, or about a month. People love the Jeffersons. They loved your mom's character. They loved her and I'm so thrilled to have had this chance to have you on the show. It's been a real pleasure meeting you and getting to know your beautiful mom through you. Thank you so much for writing the book, Sanford. And thank you for taking the time to appear on our show. Well, thank you for taking the time to interview me. And I appreciate that. But now that I've been interviewed by the famous Harvey Brownstone, I know everything's going to be okay. <laughs> Absolutely. It will be okay for sure. Our guest has been Sanford K. Sanford, son of the beloved actress Isabel Sanford. His book, entitled Her Fans Call Her Wheezy, But I Call Her Mom, is now available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistants, Rosa Puzo and Robert Monaghan, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.